Kiki kat rumah kan di dapur. Guys on YouTube. Hello, good morning. Uh, good morning. Volker. Yes, good morning, Tansri. What time is it there? It's uh, eight in the morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's three in the afternoon, yeah? Yeah, yeah, just after three. So mm -hmm. you, you can hear my voice clearly? Yes, it's okay. I'm yeah. sorry for the okay. hiccup we had last time. No problem. But uh, there's also a blessing in disguise because we can speak uh, again after a very short time already. <laughs> yes. Always uh, good, good to think positive, isn't it? That's right. It's always a silver lining to every cloud. <laughs> exactly, yes. And silver linings, uh, silver linings we need these days, isn't it? Oh my gosh, we need the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case... The in that case, you are in a much better position than we in Germany. You have much more sunshine, that's for sure. <laughs> well, in the real context and also metaphorically, we're the same. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, Tansri, I think you need a very little introduction to our viewers. Um, just a few words. Uh, Tansri Rafida Aziz is a long-serving minister in the Malaysian administration from the late 70s to the early 2000s and she is one of the most knowledgeable persons I know in Malaysia in terms of politics, economies, um, culture, everything and I have the pleasure today to have a short discussion with you about say current affairs in Malaysia, in uh, Asia Pacific and globally. So thank you very much for agreeing to speak with us and maybe we can start our discussion uh, by a short uh, update, what is the situation like at the moment in Malaysia? We have, uh, of course, the COVID is all over the place, but we also have economic woes, political uh, woes. Um, we have recently, forgive me for, for saying that, Malaysia in the news for the wrong reason was a statement on France. So uh, a lot of uh, things are staring up at the moment. Well, actually, I just want to say as far as politics concerned, we are in sort of state of flux. Uh, the king has rejected uh, the prime minister's request to have an emergency declared for mm. very valid reasons. And that uh, tomorrow parliament will sit and okay. the government will be presenting the budget. Now, we don't know how that will go because, uh, as we know, that budget didn't involve consultations mm. uh, like we do consultations uh, with all the stakeholders. So um, it's going to be fun to watch, it may use the word, meaning yeah. that there will be certainly debates on both sides of the aisle, yeah, or yeah. on many sides in, yeah. uh, in, in Parliament tomorrow. So we'll see how that comes out. Mm -hmm. But on the COVID, well, thank goodness, we are able to control it, to manage it. Right. New small clusters are evolving, but that doesn't warrant uh, any severe measure like a total lockdown and so on. Mm. This is an all restricted um, mm. movement order and so on, yeah. yeah. And so, um, talking about uh, economy, I guess the government will have to think what we shall do post COVID. It's not just about handling matters now as COVID uh, spreads everywhere mm. globally and regionally, but also what we in Malaysia need to do to enhance our own um, economic uh, foundation and economic growth, you know, like domestically generated growth to trigger the kind of economic sector, or the various economic sectors that are going to have economic spin-offs down mm -hmm. the line. Yeah. And also to have measures uh, to strengthen our bilateral and regional relationships because trade will have to go on and businesses will have to uh, devise new relationships about uh, regarding doing business with each other. Mm. We have the IT providing us these new innovative ways because I don't think physical constraints should also constrain them from enhancing business opportunities and potential, mm. uh, exploiting potential, right? Yeah. So again, uh, there might be this, uh, this uh, little advantage during the pause for business people in Germany, in Malaysia, Europe, uh, in Asia, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, to rethink about their business uh, models, uh, think about where they can strengthen the, their position along the whole value chain. Mm. And most importantly, as I said earlier, to start 
uh, strengthening relationships based on digital platforms, based on the new uh, ideas that come out out of this need during mm. the pandemic. Mm. So that's important. If you go still the old traditional way, it might not work anymore. Yeah. I think that's a little bit of a, let's say, both sides of the same coin. You know, when I speak to companies, there is a tendency to say, oh, we want to go back to the old normal. You know, we want to travel, we want to meet, we want to sit in one room. Uh, and the other more, let's say, uh, younger, more technology savvy companies, they come up with new ideas, with new solutions, like the Zoom conference, which is not new. It has been happening before. But I think in many aspects, the COVID uh, pandemic is uh, speeding up certain processes and uh, companies have to make sure that they are not left behind in the phase after the pandemic. Correct. And also, as I've said, we're talking about the value chain. It's just not talking about interfacing, you know, whether on Zoom or physical interfacing. It's right. about your position, your company's position along that value chain. Hmm. Uh, sometimes if you are not uh, uh, integrated into the new value chain, as we know now post-pandemic, uh, you may be left out hmm. in that business chain. You know? So this is something every uh, company will have to start looking at the impact yeah. of what's happening now on their individual uh, companies. But of course, I think, there are, I think you have to distinguish right. between the sectors. You know, Not everything can be done digitally. You know? At the end of the day, right. If you are in the old brick and mortar business, uh, at the end of the day, you have to build a house physically. Um, right. on, on the other hand, you talk about 3D printing. You know, there are always uh, new right. ideas, new, uh, new innovations coming along, and uh, Corona is definitely speeding up this process. Well, as you know, already last year, if I'm not mistaken, early last year, uh, well before anybody thought about this global pandemic, we are already talking about the mega trends globally. You remember? Of course. How yeah. things have, will change and how technology will change. All kinds of activity, economic and social activities, even mm. the Internet mm. of Things. In other words, it's, not, it's no longer uh, forecasting what will happen. It's now time for us to realize that this has to happen. Mm. Uh, it yeah. has accelerated. Yeah. Uh, these advancements and this innovation. Very and good. I don't think it's bad, it's very good, but in order to optimize the benefits from all that, every company, and I, I don't say sector, that's why I use company, because mm. you have to relate to the sector that you're in, yeah. right? Yeah. Whether yeah. Your, your sector, your, well, your company mm. will remain relevant in the whole infrastructure, that's important. Very true. You I talk mean, you about brick and mortar, an... Yeah, you are also, in a, let's say, a, an academic um, uh, specialist in economy. We have a, um, a very, say, a heated debate about the monopolistic powers of the technology companies. You know, we talk about, yeah. in Asia, we talk about Alibaba, in US, we talk about Amazon, Google, Facebook, and so on. Do you see that these huge companies, and they are gaining traction, they are doubling and tripling their market share, uh, basically quarter by quarter, do you see there is a, there's a risk in it and that governments should do something about it? Well, uh, I guess when, you, um, when companies uh, take advantage of the environment, the changing environment around them and offer the range of services, the range of platforms that will enable them to grow so fast and make all these trillions mm. uh, during uh, pandemic, for example, because people cannot... Uh, uh, interact physically, you know, things cannot be the way it was before. Well, that we don't blame them for that. Now, the only thing that we must be very careful is that the parameters will have to be set globally mm. for people in these kind of sectors that yeah. may have that intrusive element into it. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? Because yeah. digitalization can actually allow people to uh, intrude into businesses into confidentiality. Mm -hmm. For example, every company will have to know what firewalls to set up yeah. so that their data will not be hacked, will not be fished and mm -hmm. whatever it is that they do uh, mm -hmm. to have this uh, uh, hacking done. Yeah. I call it hacking in that very broad context, right? Yeah, now, yeah. that is a small measure. There are other things that uh, may evolve from the ability to be intrusive. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that it is not one government doing it. 
it should come under the WTO. This is where I feel very sad that the WTO as the uh, arbiter of all these uh, trade related issues, bar tar barriers and non-tariff barriers, are not doing anything about mm. this. It seems yeah. to be important because if we have a global parameter set out for this, then there's very little likelihood of any company while making their trillions, yes, but very little likelihood of them being able to take advantage of that size of theirs to do damage. Mm, because we, we yeah. see that happening all the time, you know? Mm. So but the we, WTO to be it. Yeah. So you are, you are calling for a more unified, more global approach to this problem rather than right. country by country or company by company. No, because these companies are global. Of course. You yeah. know, they, they go, they are in the U and they're everywhere. And then you know, there's no point one country curtailing them or, you know, blocking them. They go to other countries, right? Mm, yeah. So if there are these global parameters, then there is this mechanism mm. that allows governments to take action yeah. uh, without others having to criticize mm. the kind of actions that are prescribed already. Yeah. It's the same as trade. This is mm. e-commerce. Yeah, yeah. Coming back to the economy directly, I was listening to a webinar from the German Chamber of Commerce, and so we saw a very um, harsh prediction in terms of uh, economic growth or economic um, um, reduction. Basically, we see forecast of minus fifteen, minus twenty percent in terms of GB, GDP numbers. Um, yes. And I mean, we have discussed it a few minutes ago, governments and policies need to think how to get out of this crisis. This is the worst uh, uh, many people mm -hmm. can think of. And uh, this looks like kindergarten when you look at the Asian financial crisis, it's much, much worse. So it's really an, an effort which is unprecedented. Uh, what do you think are the, the, the measures needed apart from printing money and giving money to the people who, who need it? <laughs> Well, that's very short-term measure, just yeah. a stop gap, I call it. Mm. I think we have to see the there is a very strong symbiotic relationship between the pandemic and all activities within the environment, whether it's economic, whether it is socioeconomic, or even political. Mm. You know, because as much as the the disease is infectious for our health, uh, it is infectious. In impacting the rest of things that's mm. happening around us and have, doing uh, impacting what we do as business people, mm. as educators, as students. You know, in other words, this is the first time that you have something like that, a health issue mm. impacting every facet of the economy. Now that is, has to be understood. So it's not just managing the COVID and everything will be fine. It has to have parallel tracks to it. Mm. Of course, the focus is managing the pandemic, but at the same time understanding which sectors of the economy are affected worst, mm -hmm. which sectors of the economy are the quickest triggers mm -hmm. of future economic growth, which need to be helped, not just help the ones in trouble, but help the ones that can, with the right kind of measures, uh, trigger positive growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know the spin-offs from some, some industries are fantastic compared to some, right? Yes, of course. The, the multiplier effect, so to speak. So mm -hmm. again, uh, the health factor, will have to be focused, yes, but at the same time, there must be teams of people in parallel looking mm. at how each country on its own and working together mm. with partners globally, regionally, uh, can actually continue to maintain those business and economic relationships mm. that have been built over these decades. Mm. Yeah, and but, this is has to be done properly. Yeah. But we also see, let's say, winners and losers at the same time, like in any disruptive uh, scenario, if you look yeah. at if you look at the airline industry, for instance, or the tourism yeah. industry, and then you compare, let's say, medical glove manufacturing companies, of which we have world market leaders in Malaysia, their share price is going through the roof, and others are fighting with liquidation and insolvency. Oh, so, yes, uh, yes. That's to be expected. Hmm. You know, some people make money out of problems. I mean, it's, I mean being very gory about it. So many people are dying. The funeral parlors are doing well. Yeah, that's true. That's that's the economy in the world. That's isn't a, it? That's, yeah, the saddest part of it. Yeah, mm. and of course, when borders are closed, the airline industry is the most affected. But unfortunately, because the airline industry is a big trigger of multiplier effects down mm. the line, the moment the airline industry is grounded, literally and physically, mm. 
the other businesses that has connectivities with the airline industry will be even worse impacted. True, yeah. you That's know, like a domino hotels, effect, like a chain people, reaction. Twelve times. I mean, uh, the studies show that the multiplier effect of the the airline industry is twelve times of mm. the economy, and yeah. that's no small matter. Yeah. Just imagine. I didn't know whether you follow in in Germany, in Berlin especially, we had the huge uh, airport project which yeah. was delayed and delayed, and just yesterday it was opened, <laughs> and only two aircrafts are flying in. You know, and uh, this All is right. a this is a real disaster for the whole industry, and nobody can foresee what is going to happen. Yeah? All airports are empty, yeah, except true, for a yeah. few that, that, that dared to open, right? But still, as you said, there are a few airlines flying. Yeah. And it costs them a lot just to open, just mm. for two airlines. Yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah. It's not worth I'd like, it. I'd like to, to change subjects a little bit. And I would like to look at China, your, your neighbor in, in the north. Um, and if I speak to our Chinese business friends, they are kind of... Uh, back to normal already you know everybody says to me you know we have the the virus under control our production is running people are traveling we just had the golden week in the first week of october where we saw hundreds of millions of people traveling back and forth like there was no COVID, and people are rubbing their eyes and say what is this you know how did they manage <laughs> yeah. but also china are well not only not only in the pandemic, also internationally, they are playing a big role in the US-China trade uh, conflict. Um, the, yes. the Silk and the Road project uh, is uh, in the discussion all over the place. What's your view on China and how they are seen in the next couple of years going forward? Well, I've always maintained that China is part of the global infrastructure. You cannot mm. deny that. They're not part of Asia anymore. Mm. You know, for us, because of contiguity, so we regard them as a regional partner. In right. fact, they are global partners to everybody. Mm. We have to take note of that, meaning that uh, China will have to share the same uh, rules prescribed, let's say, for trade under WTO and similar rules that are prescribed in any other world forum mm. that has power to prescribe rules and regulations. Eh? So that's one thing. And secondly, you talked about how fast they came out of the pand pandemic. That's the advantage of big countries. Uh, of course, not all big countries are able to manage it such that they are able to exploit their domestic consumption. Mm. For China, the domestic market alone can generate growth. The, the teeming Chinese, you know, once you allow them that space to do what they were doing before pre-COVID, they then can stir up the economy again, hmm. meaning that everybody's back in business, back in doing what they were doing, and domestic consumption itself, and domestic investment to take care of that domestic consumption goes on. That's right. What they have been curtailed is only trade with the rest of the world. And that too not really curtailed because people still ship out things from China. Hmm. It's only the US that's got having problems with China, right? Mm, yeah. Other countries source so many things from China. Well, the US, they still source from China and they burden their own people by having the high tariffs. Mm, yeah. You see? Well, that's going to be very that's going to be very interesting next week, you know, given the presidential yeah. election. Uh, okay. yeah, what but will be me, the, yeah. the strategy of the US towards China depending on the result of the presidential election? Yeah? And you talked about the uh, the, the Chinese uh, introduced uh, belt road uh, belt yeah, belt and road initiative. Right. Well, um, I gave a talk uh, organized by the Chinese embassy not too long ago, and I mentioned that that initiative is very good. My Malaysia is a participant, including in the infrastructure fund, but I caution that everything that you do it has to be transparent. It has to subscribe to the norms of uh, uh, what such businesses entail. In other words, it's not, uh, should, of course, people allude to the fact that it may be politically motivated, you know, it's like political hegemony using mm -hmm. economic resources. Well, it's up to them to, 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 to say what it is. But to me, when you open up the passageway, literally from east to west, north to south, that is to spur growth along the way for those countries that were closed before, right? Yeah. But it's up to each country that's participating in those projects, each and every one of those projects, mm. to monitor that they're not being used or abused. Yeah, very you see, true. And when, whatever, yeah, whatever yeah, deals you make, it has to be really something that benefits everyone. 
along the line. Hmm. It's very interesting that you mention it because I also follow the discussion on the Belt and Road project. And when I spend time with my Asian friends, uh, generally they are positive about it. And like you say, they are generating growth, they are generating jobs, especially when you look at uh, projects they did in Sri Lanka, in the in uh, Africa, especially. Uh, yes. I would say in the Western world, it's looked a little bit more suspicious, to be to be honest, because they say it's a strategy for a new form of colonization. You know, the debt trap is a, is a buzzword in that, um, and it's it's very tricky to 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 get an objective view on it. Yeah. Correct, but the problem is that some countries of the West that do criticize that that way, ask themselves, what are they doing for these countries? Exactly. You know, they offer no alternative. Decades yeah. ago, Zach not only offer mm. alternative, participate, mm. come in and have a share in that uh, growth, um, you know, the helping of growth in these economies. Mm. But every, is the only China that's coming in, the rest just stand by and criticize. Naturally, these countries should be grateful to China. I mean, course, it's a human yeah. nature, right? Mm. When everybody mm. neglected us, uh, we were in poverty, nothing except, you know, exploitation in the marketplace. Mm. Uh, when China comes with all this, well, they receive it positively. Mm. And they, you know, they may mm. not be in a position to see whether there are any avenues for uh, exploitation or whatever. But then, as I've said, those big countries come on board. Right, right. Not right, to rival right. China, so. to complement China. Correct. Yeah. Right. You know, and, yeah. and, and monitor. Yeah. yeah. Rafida, you have been traveling the world in your career and you have seen, I would say, definitely more than 100 countries, if not all of them. Um, when we <laughs> look a little bit in, into Europe, you have been on many trade missions here with, uh, with uh, MIDA and uh, delegations from Malaysia. What is your message to Europe, Germany especially? Uh, why would companies, especially now, look into Southeast Asia and Malaysia especially? Well, we are where growth is happening, mm -hmm. you know, because this is, if you look collectively, don't look at Malaysia with 33 million people, we're small, but small as we are, our connectivity to China, we, as you know, our arrangement, economic arrangements, trade arrangements with China, India, mm -hmm. I mean, that alone can give you an idea of using Malaysia to get into these countries mm -hmm. with the facilities or, or the flexibilities provided in the arrangements. And of course, we are also uh, tied up with Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Japan. You see, in other words, for, for Malaysia, we always say that we are right there in the center of mm -hmm. this newly formed Asian hub. Yeah. And of course, not just Malaysia, the ASEAN. Because we are part of ASEAN, you see, we are alone 600 million people. Mm. We're not just serving uh, the market for other people, reach for other people, not just mm. that. We are a yeah. market unto ourselves. Yeah, I Our think finger. ASEAN is a very good uh, buzzword. I'm a great fan of ASEAN and I have traveled all these countries. Um, can you still hear me? I'm losing the connection. Yes, I can. Yes, okay. I can. Yeah. I was saying, especially now, we see the ASEAN uh, 10 countries and we see the EU as a group of the 27 European countries. But uh, yes. I see lack of empowerment of these larger organizations. And especially now, each and every country is looking after their own interest, you know. Um, so, how can we revive? And we also have these free trade agreement talks. Uh, some of them have been uh, succeeding with Vietnam, for instance, uh, Singapore, Malaysia is a bit uh, tricky and uh, stuck somewhere uh, along the way. Um, what would it need to revive all these uh, positive ideas and this momentum of working together regionally, intra-regionally as well as inter-regionally? Well, I think uh, this inward looking attitude of countries individually, whether Europe, whether America, whether in Asia, is to be expected now with the COVID, you know, everybody's inward looking. Mm. But that doesn't mean that this should be the norm. Mm. It should be that we continue with what we were doing in the past. But unfortunately, many countries change leaders, change governments, including Malaysia, mm. and uh, there are new people, new faces in the bureaucracy 
who don't have much institutional memory. Mm. You know, they, they bring in new ideas and or maybe they forget that what we agreed upon before in terms of settling some negotiations or some very good agreements, um, you know, didn't have to go on, go on to another measure. So you see the changes in the government uh, structure, the changes in government people atti attitudes uh, everywhere. It's not just Malaysia, everywhere, of really. Course, yeah. So you find that the dynamics are different. My era, we understood all this. Mm -hmm. It so happened that in that era, everywhere, the leadership of those countries everywhere understood that globalization is the way to go, right? Yeah. And that is being strengthened by regionalization. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the clarion call and we, we put into effect. Yeah. Today, Nobody talks about globalization anymore. Yeah, it's a I mean, it all started first. when it all started when uh, I think it was about the uh, the mask and uh, the medical equipment stuff in the beginning of the pandemic when there was a shortage uh, of supply. Yeah. Everybody now suddenly says we have to produce our on our own, you know, rather than to give it to those countries yeah. where who has the best competitive yeah. uh, advantage. Um, but at what cost? Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. see. Yeah. I mean, they talk about increasing. To, yeah, in other words, we're going back to square one. We produce everything that we want, and it's mm. not going to be competitive because yeah. we are not cost competitive. Mm. It's no longer com comparative advantage; it's competitive advantage, right? Mm. Yeah. So whether or not leaders change, government change, but the fundamental fundamental factor is everybody should be allowed to serve the world, the global market, right? By mm giving them that space to produce, to supply what they're most competitive in so that everybody benefits. Mm. If I can sell you one ring, one dollar or one euro worth of something mm. and you have to make it in Germany at five euros, why would you want to do that? Yeah. And then if we bring in this thing into Europe and you slam a tariff that will make it five euros equivalent to yours so that it's fair, I think well, as, an economist, as an economist, I can say to you, our old friend David Ricardo is looking around the corner again, isn't it? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. We're talking about economists and so on, just to let you know, the present Prime Minister of Malaysia was my student yeah. uh, in the Faculty of Economics. I mean, I, I mean, in the University of Malaya, he didn't, he didn't join the faculty, he, he branched into arts, I think, mm. but my first year student. So in other words, well, this new generation, yeah. It, they, I, I hope he know. still listens to you and he seeks your advice. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not in the. <laughs> I'm not in that situation of wanting to advise people unless asked for. But what I'm saying is that you have to look back and see where we have progressed. Mm -hmm. What were the fundamentals that we held on to to progress to whatever stage that we were before COVID? Mm -hmm. If yeah. we start a new, you know, totally in a new premise of Malaysia first or ASEAN first or Germany yeah. first, yeah, yeah. we will we'll all be in deep trouble. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tantra Rafida, I, I cannot, uh, I, I don't hesitate to ask you, I know you are always very outspoken. When we read and see something happening in Malaysia from a European perspective, uh, the last couple of years, and I follow Malaysia, as you know, for more than 20 years, Whenever we read something about Malaysia in the news, usually it's not so funny for Malaysia, you know. We have the, the one MDB <laughs> scandal, uh, we have the Anwar Mahathir saga, so to say, more than 20 years. Uh, now we have a statement of uh, Dr. Mahathir, which is causing a big uh, hoo-ha in the media about the terrorist attack in France and the, the statement he put up on tweet. Uh, how do you um, look at all these messages one, we receive here? Correct. Because Malaysia has so much more to offer and we only see the bad news. You know? let, on that Mahathir's tweet, let me put it uh, in, in context, right? I don't know who did it, but they took out one paragraph, para 12, and just viral that. When mm. he had, he started with para 1 right down to, I can't remember how many paras. In other words, the, if you read the whole context, you see some validity in what he's mm. saying. Yeah. He, he didn't say those words and say, that's it. No. Yeah. But I think this is, again, malice or, again, people who want to take advantage of what's available on IT, right. uh, such as Twitter, to, you know, to, to do some yeah. malice. I don't know. But I must tell you that you read the whole blog, it's not exactly what people interpret it to be. Yeah. yeah. I think you know? surely it was taken 
out of context, but I also have to say okay. he is mature enough and he knows how the media works and it could be well, expected. Well, let me put it this way. Yeah, but let me put it this way, Volker. Uh, everybody in this world should respect everybody else's faith. Yeah, the do's and the don'ts. What's sensitive to everybody? Of course. I mean, uh, for us Muslims, we're not allowed to even, we're prohibited from portraying visually yes, our prophet. That's a no-go. Yeah. And surely it hurts us to have people look, make a caricature out of it. Mm. Uh, well, people like me, level-headed enough to see what these idiots are doing. And I won't go beyond that. Mm. You know what I mean? We do know there are a lot of mad people around the world, but there are others who are so, um, I would say, fanatic about it and mm. won't do harm. The yeah. same way if we were to, you know, for a Christian, if we were to, let's say, have allow some idiot to desecrate the, the statue of Jesus, the pictures mm. of Jesus, can you imagine yeah. how the upcry would be with I this? I think we don't, real we don't need to go yeah. any further into this subject. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. So meaning that uh, if we take care to be aware of and sensitized to the uh, what is sensitive to people's religion, other people's social culture, whatever. I think there'd be more peace, right? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Why? Yeah. I need to do that all in the in the in the context of freedom of speech. That's not freedom of speech. Mm, yeah. You know, that's hurting somebody. I must yeah. say because Muslims don't like it either. Yeah. But it depends how far you go. Mm, yeah. Well, I, I don't think, think coming. It Coming back to my, my original uh, statement on this subject, um, how is Malaysia portrayed in the Western media? I think we can agree oh, yeah. that okay, some that is, better PR is needed. Yeah? No, 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 not, not better PR. People who are in leadership positions, yeah, they're not necessarily leaders, you know, they happen to have vied for the post and got it, right? Mm. Leaders are the person, leadership is the post. The post doesn't mean anything if you don't have the qualities of leadership. leadership. But anyway, just to, just to not be labelled on that, these people who are in the chair or seats of power, if they don't create all this nonsense that lead on to financial scandals, lead on to you know, violating this, that and the other, why would Malaysia get a bad name? Yeah. Right? It's not Malaysia. It is idiots who, get the, who did it. I'm sorry. I, 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 that's all I have to say. Hmm. People who don't think about the country are idiots. It's yeah. so self-centered. You know, hmm. yeah. everything we do, if you're in that position, you must think back. It's not doing for yourself, it's for the country you now. Hmm. If you do something that's out of turn and so happen you're doing it for yourself, that's a double, de double jeopardy. Yeah. And I don't blame foreigners for looking down on us as a basket case in the making. Hmm. All right? Yeah, and we when know we every, try so every investor... Every investor yeah, is you know up. that. You've seen how we grew. Yeah, you know how much effort everybody puts in before to even uh, persuade people like you to come and invest in Malaysia, right? Mm -hmm. And your colleagues from Germany and from Europe because they understood we are sane people here. We have people in the leadership positions that knew what to do. Of course, we're not perfect, but still. Yeah, but uh, I, can, I can share with you people. all the business people I know who have uh, business and operations in Malaysia and who know and understand Malaysia. I would say nine out of 10 are ha really happy and they are increasing their investments. They are growing. They stay in the country yeah. because Malaysia is such a beautiful and nice place to live and work. You know, and have you, you have a very yeah, nice, yeah, yeah. let's say, a balance uh, of quality of work, quality of life, uh, cost of doing business. It's all advantageous. And like you say, it's it's very sad to see that this reputation is damaged every now and then by these individuals, well, as like you say. To, uh, I would like to urge our friends uh, abroad, especially in Germany and in Europe, to please remember, uh, please segregate the country from the individuals who cause the country harm and the, uh, cause the country to have a bad image. Mm, yeah. Because once these people go, end of story. <laughs> You know, you can always yeah. extract, extricate these people one yeah. by one. Yeah. The democratic well, process will, will do it. it will but the country will stay. We have good fundamentals, economic fundamentals. The society does not like to see these disruptions. We don't like it as Malaysians, you know. Hmm. So I would like to urge uh, European investors, do see us in the long term. Leaders, so-called leaders, come and go. And most of the time they've gone. 
but the country will stay. The civil service is there. Yeah. In the, by, by by and large, they are you know with uh, very good credentials yeah, to support the private sector. I can so, and I write that hundred percent what you say. You know, I I know Malaysia for more than twenty that, years. It's... Let three or four three or four rats, you know, cause <laughs> you to, to bomb the whole place. Yeah, I don't know. I had a, a Facebook posting when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, read to me, yeah. Yeah, if something happens in Germany because of one or two people, let us say, we're not going to say Germany is bad. Mm, yeah. No, we yeah, will recognize I, who caused the problem. Yeah. Please continue yeah. your very vivid and outspoken Facebook post. They, they are really uh, interesting pieces I to read. Will, yeah. when, I reach my, when I reach my limit, then I take pen to paper, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Chancellor Rafida, I, I'd like to come to the end of our interview, not without asking you, because you have such a vast experience. You have traveled so much. Are there any visits or any conversations or any meetings standing out from if you look back in, in hindsight? Are there any unique situations you, you memorize uh, very lively? Oh, yeah. yeah, the most unique situation, I would say, I, I'm looking at purely economic, right? Was to formalize the WTO from the get. Because okay. I was I was there from day one, from day one until we signed in Marrakesh. So you know how long it took. And it gave me that perspective of how people think, how the big powers think, how the small countries think. Mm. And when the WTO came out, it showed that we had a meeting of minds. And mm. that was very good. Yeah. Similarly, the regional arrangements that we formulated or we, we set up, you know, big countries like Japan, uh, you know, talking to us, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, but small countries relatively. Mm. And we managed to have these regional arrangements, which means again, coming to a meeting of minds about common interests mm. and what benefits us uh, together, mutually beneficial. So uh, to me, that's a main thread of things that I remember. Yeah. Of course, along the way, there'll be a lot of quarreling, there'll be a lot of <laughs> arguments, imagine, yeah. but that's fine. Yeah. But it's what happens at the end. Yeah, but sad to say today, people don't talk anymore. Let the law negotiate. Less, yeah. That's my yeah. saddest. Even though we have many saddest, more means. Not say less. Yeah, even though exactly, we have... Exactly, but they don't. They don't. Mm. Blatant, Which is very sad uh, and very surprising violent. because now we have so many means of communication, you know, the, the, the smartphone, right. the internet, the Zoom calls. Exactly. People should talk more, not less. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. It saddens me. It's like dismantling all those uh, mutually beneficial arrangements that we set up in mm -hmm. the past. Yeah. I'd like to share... I'd like to share with you um, one memory I have of yourself when I first met you. I said th that's a very interesting uh, story. Uh, I like to always to share with my friends because you were leading one of the trade missions to Germany and you gave your presentation on Malaysia and there was this huge ballroom filled with, I think, more than 200, 300 people, uh, German businessmen who are interested to know about Malaysia. And at the end of your talk, one gentleman stood up and said, excuse me, minister, uh, I have a very bad experience in Malaysia with corruption. Uh, and uh, we had this and that case and uh, everybody felt like, oh, you don't dare to ask that minister. And then you very candidly said in an open forum, excuse me, sir, uh, after the talk, please come to me, give me your name and contact details. I will look into it. And by the way, sir, it always needs two to do a tango. And uh, the audience gave a roaring applause uh, with that kind of uh, statement from you. Well, and, uh, yeah, let me put it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let me put it this way. Let me put. Let me tell you this. I won. I see. I attended every year the international. I mean, the annual luncheon of the uh, International Chamber of Commerce. Hmm. Yeah, where foreigners uh, take turn to become chairman or president. Right. And one of them, uh, the president was from Denmark, mm -hmm. yeah, Danish, which means that he's from Carlsberg. Right. And he opened his speech by saying, uh, my topics, and he went to topic corruption. And he says, we can tolerate a certain level of corruption. And I took notes. And then when I spoke, I just told him, shame on you. How can you even announce you to can tolerate a certain level? What level? $3? $3,000? Three million, yeah. right? 
if you have an attitude an international chamber having that attitude of saying publicly to the world we can tolerate or you can tolerate a certain level of corruption and left open for interpretation starting from three dollars to 300 million maybe well you are actually advocating corruption mm. you should say zero tolerance of corruption yeah. then you end the story so in other words that's what i said it takes two to tango exactly, these yeah. guys don't mm. mind if corruption is affordable yeah. you know what i mean yeah but also on this one things have changed <laughs> no? we have compliance departments now we have much more uh, yeah. checks and balances nobody tolerates check. corruption yeah, you can't tolerate. You can't tolerate whether there is a policeman on the road stopping a car or somebody vying to get a $100 million contract. It's the same. It's a, in principle. Yeah. I don't agree with, you know, corrupt, but yeah. if you are prepared to pay and the other person is weak enough to receive, even without being asked, mm. well, yeah. you know, who is to Very blame? You it's, still, you know. it's still a global problem, yeah. It is global. In fact, elsewhere it's bigger. And I must say, this is not just between business and gov government. Everywhere in the world, corruption within the business community is so much bigger mm -hmm. because most of the construction of real estate and so on are owned by a private sector, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to open a hotel. It's not a government hotel. And the hotel is worth 300 million, right? Yeah, yeah. He has 10 contractors vying for that contract. Do you think the 10 contractors, one or two of them will not be prepared to pay whoever's heading that project of the of the hotel and say, okay, I'll give you X million, give yeah. me the contract. Well, you it's see? tempting. Yeah. And that's, that's what I told the uh, International Chamber at that luncheon meeting. Mm -hmm. I said, the corruption in the government is very visible. Building a school, that's a government school, government road, you know? Yeah. But we can't keep track of the private sector construction, private sector project. There are hundreds, if not thousands, right? Mm -hmm. God yeah. knows how much money float. Yeah. Uh -huh. So very nobody true. does this. For me, it's a question about values and integrity. Mm -hmm. Whether it's business to business, business to government. Yeah. Rafina, for effect. me, for me, it's always a, a sheer pleasure to speak with you. You know, we are, there's always uh, a, a lesson to be learned from listening and, and talking to you. So, uh, well, and I think the I leaders of the leaders of the world should listen to you more closely, not only in Malaysia <laughs> but anywhere. So, um, well, I, I do give them what I feel, what I need to say. Whether it's American president, it does not matter to me. I mean, I've got a history of just saying it as it is to whoever uh, that I'm speaking to. Yeah. Uh, there are no niceties as far as I'm concerned. And I think this is what people like <laughs> about like. you. You know, I have to give you my compliments as well. Uh, so <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much again, indeed. It was uh, well, uh, great and entertaining uh, and informative. And maybe yeah, you Mary have... to your friends in the chamber and in, in Germany that have interest in Malaysia. Very true. I will... Uh, Talk to them and I will get back to you when I get their feedback. So thank you also again and regards to your family uh, and you. friends uh, all around Malaysia and uh, hope to see you soon in person. Thank you. And I hope this pandemic will ease off so that travel can start again and business can be more vibrant. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.